All right, awesome. Well, we have a, a good group here, and I'm assuming a few people will jump on shortly, but we're going to get started. Um, so it looks like we have a nice mix, some teachers in Kindle, um, a few teachers who have either gone out or going out this summer, as well as some um, other alumni from years back. So really exciting that we have a whole mix of people um, in this group. So as you can see, Allison Seymour is here joining us. We're really lucky to have her presenting today. Um, to give a little bit of context, she was awarded a teacher's fellowship back in 2011 and fielded on um, mammals in Nova Scotia. She also did another teacher fellowship um, studying reef fish of the Virgin Islands and has volunteered on two of our retail teams, songbirds of the Tetons and tracking sea turtles of the Bahamas. Um, and also one of our one day short duration projects out of Los Angeles called LA Urban Resiliency Program. So she'll be sharing about some of those experiences and how she's brought them into her classroom. She's been teaching in California for a number of years, uh, although she just relocated to Arizona. So today she's gonna be sharing with you all um, how next generation science standards have worked in her classroom using her EarthWatch expedition. Um, both kind of talking you through the 5E model and argumentative inquiry. Uh, so we're really happy to have her and um, share her expertise here. So I'll let her take it away. One last little note is if you see on the bottom, um, there's a little bar and there's a chat section. So you can chat to the group any questions you have as we're going through. Um, and at the end, we'll leave about 10 or so minutes for Q&A. Uh, so Allison can answer any of your questions and, and of course you can always follow up with anything afterward as well. Uh, so thank you Allison, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so my name is Allison Seymour and as Lucy already told you, I've been on four Earthwatch expeditions and the first one was actually nine years ago. And when I first did it in my classroom as a lesson, it was very different than I'm doing it now. Um, having taught in California and with next generation science standards um, being a, a big part of what we're doing, I reconfigured some of those lessons into a more NGSS model. So what I hope to do today is not give you a ton of depth, we've got about an hour, but kind of a quick, let's think about it, how to, I hope to have both questions and discussions at the end um, of things that ev either you've done or maybe something's been prompted in your imagination as we've gone through the presentation. So we can do a little sharing at the end. Um, for some of you, I know the Next Generation Science Standards is going to be a review. Um, I've also gotten some comments that some people are not familiar with them at all. So we'll do a little bit of both as we go along the way. Um, so this is bringing your EarthWatch experience into the classroom. Um, seventh grade teacher, primarily uh, teaching life science. So you're going to see that my lessons are very much geared in that direction. So let's see what our goals are. Like I said, we're kind of a high level. Let's see what this is about. Give you some resources at the end. Um, so to provide information discussion on how to translate your Teach Earth, EarthWatch expedition to your students, which is really that outreach we want to do through EarthWatch and getting our kids excited about science. There's nothing like seeing your, your teacher actually out in the field. In fact, the picture is me out in the field, and that was in the Virgin Islands. Um, cleaning parasites off a, a screen, and if you've ever taught middle school, gross things are really good to talk about. You usually have their interest. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over NGSS just to give us kind of a common framework to work from, and then go through two models that I quite like and have become very popular in doing NGSS. One is the 5E model. Um, you've probably seen that a little bit more than the second model, which is argument-driven inquiry. So I've taken two of my EarthWatch expeditions and used these two models. And you can see the standards that I follow are very similar but two different approaches and two different ways for students to be able to interact with this information. And I, as I said at the end, I hope we have uh, questions and answers, but mostly also discussion uh, to be able to share. It's not often that we all get to, to talk, I think, across the country on, on a particular topic, especially as, as EarthWatch um, teachers. So let's talk about next generation science standards. Uh, I believe a number of teachers on this webinar are from California. So you know California is one of the states that has adopted next generation science standards. And next generation science standards, this actually quote comes from the appendix A, is the quote, 
The next generation science standards are student performance expectations, not curriculum. Performance expectations simply clarify what a student will know and be able to do. And I'm really going to concentrate on that word do. So it's less that sage on the stage and what can we get our kids hands on doing both conceptually, both getting their hands dirty. What can we do to really engage them in science? So in Next Generation Science Standards, in the performance expectations, they talk about a three-dimensional model. And you're going to see this graphic um, color-coded, always color-coded, over and over again in Next Generation Science Standards. And it's the idea you need all three dimensions in your lesson plan, in your experience with the students to get the greatest benefit of learning. And the three parts of the diagram is DCIs, disciplinary core ideas, that is kind of what we used to call standards. You know, that's what they need to know this, okay? They need to be able to understand this concept, okay? Cross-cutting concept goes across the DCIs. So things like, there are patterns, there are cause and effect. So many of these things, especially cross-cutting uh, concepts, you're gonna be using over and over and over throughout the year to show students how they connect. So we're trying to take science from isolation to making it broad reaching and thought provoking in that, wow, a molecule is made up of atoms, but it's, which are smaller parts. Well, a cell is made out of smaller parts. What are cross cutting concepts? And then as you know, through all the STEM work that's being done in the schools, engineering is becoming a large part of our teaching in science. So the SEPs, Science and Engineering Practices, are looking for those engineering skills and incorporating them in. Now, I've been for the last couple of years in a lot of NGS workshops throughout the day. I remember the first couple I went to, the acronyms and the names, it took a while to get used to. So if this is your first time seeing it, deep breath, <laughs> it's okay. Um, one of the things that I said about the color coding DCIs are color coded in orange, um, engineering practices in that blue purple and cross cutting concepts in the green. And you're going to see that over and over again. Now, again, I said when I was first working with this standards, you kind of panic a little bit. And this is why. This is one page is this third grade standards for um, ecosystems. And it looks like a lot of information at first. And if you take a step back and really kind of break it down, on the top, we have our performance expectations. In this standard, what are we expecting the kids to know? Okay. If you look at the blue, still color-coded, what engineering practices, science and engineering practices, are we expecting them to learn? That's kind of the how to do science, how to think through a problem. Um, a lot of my students say, well, this is science class. You know, why do I need to learn engineering? And one of the basic things you can say is, Engineering is using science to solve a problem. And so it is very interrelated. So get your kids on board, even if they're not in a STEM class, they're in science, uh, engineering still very much applies. Our discipline core ideas, which is the orange, is in the center. And the green are the cross cutting concepts. One of the things that the authors of Next Generation Science Dancing have done is they have cross referenced um, practically everything. So again, when you look at this, and if you haven't used these standards before, it does look overwhelming, but we're, the whole point of today is really to take these kind of more complex teaching styles and next generation science standards and break it down to something manageable that hopefully when you get done with this webinar and you go, hey, I'd kind of like to do a 5E model on my lesson, you have a good starting place to do that. And hopefully um, a simplified version to, to help you get that first couple steps done. Okay, back to kind of in a nutshell, I'm not going to go through all the standards um, and I'm really not going to go through the actual parts in much more detail, but kind of in the nutshell, um, one of the important shifts towards three-dimensional teaching is moving away from having students merely learn about concepts or ideas to preparing them to figure out or solve problems. That is, what can they do? Okay, and this is where I kind of want to start bringing in our EarthWatch experiences. So those of you who've been out on the field, kind of apply this. Those of you who have not been out on the field, think about how you can gather some of these resources together. So 
where to start. What I would like you to think about as you start your planning is, what problem was your expedition trying to solve? Okay. What was that basic problem? What data did you gather? What data can your students then use? Uh, each time I go to expedition, I keep logbooks. And these logbooks have been so valuable in talking to the students. And it could be on a laptop. I keep mine on paper. One of the things that I tell students um, sometimes when we can't get the, the laptop cart is most of science in the past was done with paper and pencil. Darwin did not go out with his digital camera and his laptop. Darwin went out with a notebook and a pen and paper, and that's how he took you know, his observations. Um, so don't be afraid to use kind of the old fashioned methods of keeping a logbook, keeping it in your backpack, letting it get messy. Um, it adds to that excitement of the student that you are actually out there as a teacher. So think about your data. Um, what type of data analysis can your students do with this data? And many of the expeditions were doing surveys. How many turtles have you seen? What are the size of the turtles? How many songbirds have you seen? What variety are there? So kind of as you're going out or if you've already been out, think about how students can manipulate that data. Also going to back to next generation science standards, um, what skills do you want them to learn? Okay. Is graphing something that your students really need to know? I know as se my seventh grade students, graphing is something that we start in the beginning of the year. They all tell me they know how to do it, and we work on it all year long as a skill. Um, the picture that you see up here is also from the uh, reef fish of the Virgin Islands. I'm using a microscope to count um, microscopic parasites. Uh, have your students used microscopes yet? Is that a skill that you would like to develop? So along with kind of the data analysis, think about those science and engineering um, practices that you would like the, the students to learn. Okay, what further research could your students do? Your Earthwatch experience is just the tip of the iceberg of what they can do and what they can explore. So think about how you can expand that. And lastly, what experiment could they create in their environment to answer the next questions? It's kind of the question of, can you create a mini Earthwatch uh, expedition for your students? And it could be as simple as if you have trees around campus, if you have insects around campus, do you have birds around your campus? Um, can you create some of that excitement? Uh, you know, my teacher got to do this expedition. I'm getting to do something similar. Isn't this, isn't this really too cool? And that's kind of where to start. That's definitely where I started um, when I did the lesson planning. What did I have in my toolbox from the expedition um, to be able to incorporate that into a lesson that fit the standards and fit the skills that I needed the students to learn? So that's kind of the where to start. Um, as you know from the introduction, I'm gonna go through two models that are being used extensively through um, the incorporation of next generation science standards. The 5E model, definitely in things that I'm seeing in publications and the reading I've been doing, the 5E model um, is very prevalent. Um, and then argument driven inquiry. Now, if you look at this, 5E model happens to have five E's, five steps. The argumentative model looks much longer. If you've never done both, ask you to kind of reserve decision which way you're going to go. Both of them, um, I hopefully will be simplified so you can go, hey, I can do that. This would be really cool in my classroom. Um, so let's start with the 5E model. What are those 5Es? Um, 5E actually came about in 1987, so it's not a brand new thing. It's from the Biological Sciences Curriculum Study, also known as BSCS. And it's a way to organize your lesson to move students through the process. So the first one, and this is from their, their site, um, is engage. You know, students, when they are engaged, learn better, they participate better, they're able to also teach their peers better, self-teaching, and you're going to see that more in the argumentative inquiry model. But again, engage that students. Uh, what we're looking for is creating excitement, how cool is it that their teacher got to go on an earth watch? Okay, that's part of the excitement. But in also getting um, more information about the kids to activate prior knowledge, to access what they know um, coming into the lesson and lay down some concepts that you're going to build on. So the engage, um, often called the lesson starter, 
um, beforehand. And you're going to see a lot of these concepts, a lot of these ideas are things we have done in our teaching for decades. Um, but they're moved and packaged a little differently in order to um, go through these new progressions. Um, explore is observations, investigations, along with questionings, student-led exploration. This could be a demonstration. This definitely could be an experiment that students do, either that you have created for them um, as a mimic to your Earthwatch expedition or one that they happen to create, but it's the actual experiment part um, or observations. Most of mine are experiment um, because I prefer that. Um, explanation. Now, often when we used to do lab reports, you know, question, hypothesis, gather your data, analyze your data, and do a conclusion. Well, the explain kind of hits that middle point where you're taking that data and constructing a conclusion. So students may do a graph and then explain what that graph means. Um, so they're taking that data collection and creating it into a conclusion. And this is a great time to add vocabulary as part of that explanation because they've now use the concepts for a while, that having the actual scientific vocabulary is what we're looking for. The next part is elaborate. Um, I've also seen this as extension, another E word. Um, practice it. Okay, now we've kind of done it once. Can the students do it again and more independently? Can they elaborate it on? Can they do a slightly more complicated experiment? Kind of what, what can they do more or what can they research more? And the last E is evaluate. Um, it could have been an A assessment, um, but it works out really well with the five E's that's evaluate. So how do you assess that the students learned? So that's a really brief overview of the five E instructional model. But as we step through um, an example, uh, hopefully this will become even clearer. So I picked the expedition I went out on in 2008 refish of the Virgin Islands as um, the 5E models. The first time, so eight years ago, way before NGSS, um, I incorporated this as my beginning lesson of the year on how to do the scientific method, where it was basically me and my PowerPoint saying to the kids, I had this great summer, and let me talk, tell you about it. Um, this lesson has been completely reworked in that it is much less of me saying I had a great summer, uh, and much more of, hey students, come discover what I was able to, to dis discover and add to what we learned. Um, so definitely a different way of looking at it. Um, I believe Lucy sent out the sheet. This is for um, middle school. The standard is ecosystems, interactions, energy, and dynamics. And what I did is in figuring out what I had, the tools I had, the data I had, the type of projects I had, what kind of cross-cutting concepts were applicable, what disciplinary core ideas did I want to highlight, and finally, what engineering practices. So these are the ones that I picked for my lesson. If a lot of the Earthwatch, not if, but a lot of the Earthwatches are very ecosystem oriented. So if you have the ecosystems, definitely middle school has it. Um, high school biology should have it as well. I know third grade uh, has ecosystems in it. It's a great place to kind of start. So again, see that the color coding and you can use standards more than once in a year. So don't feel like you just use a standard and then you go on. So I said I would be using the 5E model for this one, okay? So engage. I'm back from expedition. I'm super excited about it. Um, depending, I think most of you have probably done summer expeditions. I've done one in the summer. I've also done one during the school year where I was able to Skype with students. That was um, small mammals of Nova Scotia. Uh, either way, come and engage the kids with photos of you, especially photos of you yucky and in the field. Um, you really want to get them, and I changed the goal for engage, a little bit less than engage, and more kind of what we want for Earthwatch, as in make your ex kids as excited about your exp expedition as you are, okay? You are going, you're coming back, you want them to to be excited about that. So that's kind of the engage. You may put a picture of yourself up and 
you know, hanging from a tree. You know, that'd be a great way to kind of start them. Um, for reef fish of the Virgin Islands, my introduction is, hey, I got to go on this great science expedition. Uh, we're going to talk about it, but before we talk about it, I want to ask you some questions. And remember, part of the engage is to get prior knowledge um, activated within the students. So my open discussion questions, and again, open discussions, no right, no wrong, really encouraging the students to talk, is what do you need to stay healthy? And a lot of the kids are, are in from summer break. Um, I need food. I might need medicine if I get hurt. Uh, I need some place to stay. I need sleep. The kids are well aware um, by the time they hit seventh grade on what it takes to, to stay healthy. Um, so the next segue is kind of, what do fish need to stay healthy? I was out in the Virgin Islands looking at fish. What do fish need to stay healthy? And again, filling the whiteboard. I'm a big filler of the whiteboard. Fill the whiteboard with all their suggestions. And kind of as a segue, um, I show that I'm not going to show you all, but I think you may be familiar with this video. So with technology all working together, hopefully. And that's not it. Oh, that's an ad. Yo, oh. dog. All right, boy. Let's see what you can do. Sykes and Oscar's Whale Wash is now open for business. Okay, for those who are familiar with that cartoon, Shark's Tail, um, this is the car wash. And they have turtles rubbing it, they have cleaner shrimp, they have brushes, and this is kind of the introduction, because what we were looking at is cleaner species of reef fish in Virgin Islands. Um, so it's kind of a nice segue without saying, hey, this is what we're looking at. So that's my engage, start to activate that prior knowledge and segue into fish. Okay, for the explore, this is go, well, let me tell you what we did in expedition. And what we did in this expedition is we collected um, blue tanks. And what we wanted to know is how the parasite levels were with or without cleaner species. And we were looking at cleaner shrimp to begin with, because the more parasites a fish have, obviously the poorer their health is and the health of the ecosystem. So we're looking at overall ecosystem dynamics, which if you check your standards, it is one of the standards for this year. So I describe, and this is me again, um, going out, collecting the fish at night, um, putting them in different uh, categories. One was our control group, and this is a great time to add uh, vocabulary such as controls, independent variables, dependent variables, but we had a control group that was just fish, um, and then we had a, another group which was our experimental group with fish and cleaner shrimp, and they had the same water, the same fruit, the same temperature, so we can bring in that concept of constants as well. And then what I do for the students is I have Ziploc bags, one from the control group, one from the experimental group. And in those Ziploc bags are paper fish with white dots on them. And those white dots represent parasites. So I don't go, hey, this is what we found out. I say, hey, this bag came from our experimental group. This bag came from our control group. You are the scientist. What are you going to do with this data? And this is the time to step back. Um, they need to kind of figure out, and it's pretty straightforward, um, but how to organize their data. And you will have a group or two that just writes data all over the place and comes come up. And it's really hard not to just whisper, use a data table, um, but do not do that. Let them go through this trial and error process to get the data and organize the data. And you can add as many fish um, as you want to make this larger or, or smaller. And I usually work in groups of two uh, for this particular project. For our explain, now they have all these numbers, okay? And so 
what do these numbers mean? That's where they need to come up with that explanation. And things that I provided um, them using a laptop um, so that they can look up some parasites, what cleaner shrimp are, give themselves some background as well. Um, but at the beginning of this lesson, and this is usually the next day, uh, reinforce the vocabulary we've used before and vocabulary they've had in the past, such as um, what is a parasite, mutualism, um, ecosystem, and then some of the words that we used the day before, such as controls it or constants, depending on what you use, independent variables, dependent variables. So you start the class kind of going over this vocabulary and then let them figure out with this collected data how are you going to present it and a graph becomes the, the the obvious scheme and it's interesting some students will try to do a bar graph some will do a line graph and if they do a line graph they, they kind of figure out it doesn't work that well so it's a great time to kind of reinforce as you're walking around you're doing a lot of kind of on the walking mentoring as you go through the group. So the explain is where they explain. Uh, the elaborate, remember one of the ways that you can elaborate is to have them go through and practice the skill. So I have three bags and the three bags are a control group, fish with cleaner shrimp, and fish cleaner shrimp and cleaner crabs. And basically say you've gone through the process. Uh, let's go through the process again with a little bit difference and see well, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, analyze your data, see if that's correct, and uh, be able to support the conclusions. And I usually have students share out the conclusion at the end. And what's interesting, and, and kind of when I know that my class gets it, is when they look at it, the shrimp with cleaner fish, it, cleaner shrimp, and the fish with cleaner shrimp and cleaner crabs, their data is very, very close together. And so part of the discussion is what do the cl cleaner crabs do? Well, do we have any data about what the cleaner crabs do? And someone will raise their hand, hopefully many people, and say, well, shouldn't we set up this experiment so we had fish and cleaner crabs? And you're like, that would have been a great idea. And so they're making that discovery and they're gonna remember that discovery much better if they come to that conclusion than if we present them that conclusion. Um, so that's how I have it set up. The fifth E, of course, is evaluate our assessment. Um, you can assess in many things if you wanted to assess uh, their vocabulary on uh, either the scientific method, dependent, independent variables, or on uh, ecological co concepts, mutualism, parasites. Um, for this lesson, beginning of the year, this is where I'm starting graphing. Um, and making sure it's labeled correctly, that the data is there correctly. Uh, this would be a bar graph for this particular uh, experiment, um, but labeling is one of the big things and scaling. Uh, students can be very creative on their scales. So that's my first lesson. That's kind of a step through the 5E. Um, hopefully you can see it's, it is a logical construct. And when you start using it in your class, you're going to find a lot of the lessons that you've used for years just fall nicely within this, this format with a little tweaking. So don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. Um, this is just another way of presenting it and hooking it into next generation science standards. All right, so that's the first model. Uh, the second model looked more complicated. It's uh, argument-driven inquiry. And uh, this is one that I only used in my class for a year. Um, I've used it several times during the year, and I can tell you, as I went through and used it more and more times, the students got it and really started to expand uh, their ability to learn from this model. So the basics of argumentative-driven inquiry is that if you make a claim, if you have a, a conclusion by a hypothesis, why do you think that's true? And what is the evidence and being able to support that evidence? Um, so National Research Council 2012, I thought came up with a good description of the role, that argumentation. And I actually used the word argumentation with one of my classes for someone. They're like, oh, cool, we get to argue with each other. And I'm like, it's not quite that kind of argumentation. It's the kind of argumentation where we can base it in a very professional way and create that interaction in the classroom. So it's great for interpersonal dynamics in the classroom as well. But back to the quote. Um, scientists and engineers use evidence-based argumentation to make the case for their ideas, whether involving new theories or design, novel ways of collecting data, or interpretation of evidence. They and their peers then attempt to identify weaknesses 
and limitations in the argument with the ultimate goal of refining and improving the explanation or design. So the nice thing is, it's not necessarily coming to just one question. We're refining, we're getting better, and you're going to see this iteration as part of argument driven. You're also going to see peer reviews, peers being able to look at another group, and I use groups of four um, in this project, and be able to show good things and weaknesses. So I don't use good and bad, I actually use strengths and weaknesses um, as a good vocabulary, at least for, for middle school. So again, more steps, looks complicated, but the claim is kind of the same thing as the hypothesis, okay? If you're given a question, if you're given a problem, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen? What do you think the result is going to be? Okay, so it's a conclusion, it's an explanation, it's a, a generalization. So once you have your claim, what evidence can you gather? We're talking experimental data here, you know? So this is the same thing we've done in, for years, just phrased a little bit different. So what is that evidence? And that evidence, so the claim fits into the evidence and the evidence supports the claim. And that's where we have this, this iteration. Your evidence is justified with a rationale and rationales where we put in words how the evidence supports the claim. So evidence itself, maybe data, graph, food web, diagram, it could be many things, but the rationale is really where we use vocabulary um, and rationale, logic, to be able to show how this evidence supports the claim, okay? Um, like I said, a little bit more complicated, but hopefully what you're going to see is I've um, simplified it into a way that I've used it in classrooms. I've used it in more expanded, and certainly if you're teaching high school, which I know we have several participants who are, um, I suggest that you do expand it. For middle school, this more simplified, um, and I would say even down to fourth or fifth grade, simplified, um, procedure works very, very well. So back to the next generation science standards. So this is an expedition I actually went on a year ago, uh, 11 months ago, uh, turtles in the Bahamas, where we were looking at green sea turtles. Um, and if you look at the cross cutting concepts, stability and change is the one that I'm looking at for this lesson. The discipline core, core ideas, very, very similar to what I did with the other one. And this science engineering practicing. So this is really seeing the same standards we figured for a different lesson. And if you look, if you have your sheet, if you look under your DCIs, there's LS2C, Ecosystems, Dynamics, Functioning, and Resilience, which is my second bullet point here. It says, ecosystems are dynamic in nature. Their characteristics can vary over time. Disruptions to any physical or biological component of an ecosystem can lead to shifts in its population. And it's actually that substandard that I'm trying to elaborate on in this particular um, lesson. So that big graph simplified. And this is what the students work off. So I said I usually use groups of four. Um, I usually do groups of different levels. I've worked at a, a public school, so I have some of my, my stronger higher achievers, some of my middle achievers, and some that needs support within the group. Um, your responsibility as a teacher really fits right here in the guiding question. After the guiding question is done, you're in a, a mentoring, monitoring role from that point on. And Figuring out that guiding question is kind of the hardest part because you want to make it not so obvious that the kids know it to begin with, um, but not so broad that they could go anywhere and completely miss the standards that, that you are trying to approach. So for this particular lesson, I picked how would juvenile green sea turtle populations be affected if all the sharks were removed by overfishing? How would their population change over time? So you're gonna see a lot of that verbiage that was in the standards, like changes over time um, and changes in dynamics. What if a species were removed in my guiding question? Now this is kind of a long guiding question and students may look at it and go, I have no idea what she's talking about, where, where to start. Um, so in this corner, this is actually a picture of uh, my whiteboard, uh, which I happen to have. This is not from this lesson. This lesson was actually, we had done an extended food web. 
And the argumented inquiry I did afterwards was this guiding question. Which member of an ecosystem would affect the food web the most if removed? And Stu still had, the first day I did this, had a hard time approaching that. So the second day, as we were going forward, I had this on my board, the guiding question again, just to reinforce it. And um, this is a student from my school. And it says, save the blank. We have data that shows they are important to the ecosystem. So that gets to the idea of data. So don't, don't feel like you can't simplify it to something the students can get behind, okay? What is most important? If I had to stand with a picket sign in front of my school to support not removing one of these animals, what would that be? So kind of phrase it so the students can approach it. Like I said, this is where you start as a teacher is providing the guiding questions. I do quite a lot of brainstorming with students, and this is where you pose the questions, but not the answers. So you're brainstorming questions. What questions do you need to figure out this answer? Okay, not what the answers are, what are the questions? So what do juvenile sea turtles need to survive? Um, what do they eat? What eats them? What does juvenile mean? Okay, sometimes we need to start with the basic vocabulary. Uh, sharks are in there. What do sharks eat? Um, what's overfishing? I don't have it there, but that would be a good one to add. Um, what is the relationship between organisms and what information is available? So that's kind of when, where you start. Um, I provide them some information, um, data from the expeditions. Um, like I said, I'm always taking data in my charts. And what I try to do is instead of typing it up and making it look all textbook-like, um, I Xerox it right off my book. So it's my handwritten notes and some of them are a little bit hard to read. And that's part of the, di the discovery, you know, is re using real data. Um, because at this point I've said, hey, I got to go on this great expedition. We were doing sea turtles. I have a collage of pictures that says, isn't this cool? I said, hey, but there is more questions to ask. And as a class, we're going to figure out what those more questions are. Okay, so um, if you haven't done food webs, uh, depending on your lesson, I do a little review of food webs. This particular lesson comes before this one. So what I get is a nice leverage the second time I do this with how to do food webs and how to go through ADI. Okay, so now you've got your groups. They have the guiding questions. As a group, they need to come up with their claim, aka a hypothesis, okay? What do they believe to be true? And it may, it will inevitably um, vary by group. Um, but here, claim was the, sea, the turtle population will increase when the sharks are removed. Um, they may say the turtle population will stay the same or, or decrease maybe even, you, you don't know. Through their experimentation, either by looking at data that I've already collected. Unfortunately, uh, you can't go out in Arizona or, or at least um, easily to look at sea turtles. What can they find on the internet? What can they find from my notes um, to provide evidence? And that evidence may take the form of drawing a food web. Uh, they may choose to do a graph or some of the best ones I've seen have just been illustrations where the kids have thought their way through the process and have come up with a conclusion. The justification is where we're going to see them using words and vocabulary to justify um, what their evidence says. And you can do this a number of ways. Um, a number of the books that I have seen have students do this on whiteboards. I do not, I actually get the large pieces of um, that really thin poster paper you can get that you tear off. I don't want to do a commercial for post-it notes, but it's like really giant post-it notes. Um, and they, they do their poster as a group. And this is really the first iteration. Remember, ADI's got some iterations. So really the cool thing that comes next is the peer review. Okay, this is where other groups look at each other's posters. And there's a couple of ways to do it. I've done it both ways. Um, one way, and um, for a first time out, I think this is a good way to go, is the posters all go around the room, like a gallery walk. And each group is given post-its. I do sound like a 3M commercial. Um, and on those post-its, 
they put three strings, three things that they think uh, is strong in the poster and three weaknesses. Again, that it's not good or bad, strengths or weaknesses. And before we do this, we do talk about how do you give feedback? Uh, what do we mean? You just can't say, I don't like the color of your poster. You know, that, that's not a, a good weakness. But often a weakness starts with, I don't understand how your graph supports your data. Or I can't understand your graph because there is no label on the X or Y axis, okay? To, so have students work on, it's almost like being the teacher. And, and I will say the students are normally much harder on their peers than I am. Um, and they may not just, in my class, just write weaknesses. They need to look at the strengths and they need to look at weaknesses. And I usually give them four to five minutes, depending on the complexity of the poster. And then everybody rotates. So they have a chance to comment on everybody's poster and the post-it notes start going all over the poster. Another method is to have one person of the team stay with the poster three people rotate around and the person who stays with their poster is in charge of explaining their poster to these new groups that are rotating through and if you have enough people um depending on your group size uh if somebody stays back as a scribe it's really really helpful then the the students who is explaining just needs to work and explain and someone can write down their notes so that the group can go back later and at the end we come together as a group and on the front board, I go, okay, what are some of the observations you made? What were some really good things about the posters? And you'll hear things like, hey, you know, the bar graph made a lot of sense, but those people who did line graphs, those, I, I didn't really get those, I just didn't understand. Or this group over here, they thought of something that our group didn't even talk about and that was really insightful. So putting up those observations on the board um, and asking questions like, what makes a poster easy to read? How, did, how were they presented? Um, what data was most convincing? Because remember, as the teacher, I haven't told them what data to, to gather. Um, so you're gonna have different groups doing different things. And um, what ideas from other groups did their group not think of kind of expand their knowledge? Okay, once they go through this process, this peer review, they then take all those post-it notes and they have a chance to revise their project, okay? And on my posters, remember I had them do it on paper, I do require them to use blue or black ink or pencil the first time around, but when they do this revision, I have them use red, okay? Or sometimes if I'm not feeling like using red, I'll have them do blue ink the first time and black ink the first second time because i want to see how they progressed in their knowledge and in their ability to think through and create this this argument so the argument i think the kids are a little bit disappointed they don't get to argue across the room um but the discussions are really really good it, it's definitely worthwhile um once they revise um for this one we often see revisions go to the point where the turtle population will increase and then decrease when the sharks are removed. So they've made that leap of, okay, once the sharks are gone, there's going to be more turtles. Well, that's great. Well, there's still the same amount of seagrass. So eventually you're going to have more turtles than you are seagrass, and you're going to see either um, stabilization or a decrease. And at this point, they're making predictions, okay? Because the sharks are still there. So they're using their background information, so the data that is available, about who eats what, how much of each thing there are to make predictions about changes over time in the future, which is a lot of what we're doing in our environmental research. Again, evidence will vary. Um, and at this point, some of the posters are getting a little bit busy, um, which is fine. Our last step, always back to the assessment. Um, assessment options, there's a couple of options and I have done all three of these. Um, if it is a smaller and, and the groups have worked really well, sometimes I just uh, assess the poster as a team grade and I add in participation points, behavior points, um, along with kind of the overall poster. Uh, what I tend to use most often is the second. I let 
students take pictures of the posters with their cell phones or I post it on our electronic classroom and each one has to write the justification up um, on their own, the justification of evidence. And this way I can see individually if students are understanding the concept, are they using the vocabulary um, appropriately and abundantly, hopefully. Uh, and it allows me to do individual grades. So if you do have um, a student, which we all know does happen, does, didn't participate much or, or, or didn't gain much from the experience, that definitely kind of comes to a highlight right there. Um, or I've done a quiz. Um, quizzes have not gone out of style, um, but the written explanation, the second bullet point is definitely the one that I like best because I think it informs me as a teacher um, best about the learning that each individual student has gone through. So those are the two models, ADEI and 5E. Um, again, as a teacher, a different role, very much monitoring. Um, one of the hardest things to do is uh, watch your kids make mistakes and learn from them. Um, so as a growth, personal growth, uh, I think that's good. Uh, this is me and my turtle. Um, kind of to, to, to wrap up, because I know we want to leave about 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, when you go through these lessons, as we know, um, the more you do them, the better they'll be and the more you'll refine. For ADI, I did it five times through the year with my same classes. The first time they had to do the poster, it was rough going, okay? They weren't really sure what they were doing. Um, they really wanted me just to tell them what they were supposed to do. Um, they were unsure about how to give peer feedback that was uh, useful. Um, and how they learned what was useful or not is that first time they sat down with their poster that had been commented on and they read the comments and they're like, well, we don't know how to make it better. And so kind of how to, to highlight weaknesses that can be fixed. Um, by the third time I did ADI, the kids knew the process. They knew what was expected of them. They were excited because it gave them a chance to interact as a group. Um, they liked the idea that there wasn't one exact answer that you could still have a poster different than another group and have it be equally valued. Um, so if you do ADI and it's rough the first time, <laughs> I think that's to be expected. Um, but by the end, it was one of the lessons when I told the kids, hey, we're doing our argumentative inquiry this week on this, this big project, um, that about the third time they were engaged and their learning was, I, I was very happy, very impressed with their learning at that point. So that's, that's kind of my, my parting words on that. Um, for Earthwatch, uh, obviously I've been involved in Earthwatch for nine years. Um, I encourage, I, many of you may be on your first expedition. I know we have some long-time alums, so stay involved. And I know I can't go on expedition every year. Um, it's hard to do, but there are other ways to be involved. So look into the ambassadors program, way to share information about Earthwatch. Um, encourage fellow teachers to apply. I've had some of my friends apply and been able to go on expedition. Even non-science teachers, I have a Spanish teacher who went, which was great to be able to, to share experiences. Um, often as an alumni, we're asked to review teacher applications, um, which I think is, is hopefully a nice benefit to them. It's also interesting to hear um, other teachers' passions and, and why they want to do it. Um, lastly, look for local opportunities. As Lucy mentioned, I did a one day uh, opportunity in LA, LA Urban Resiliency. I'm down here, the silly looking one in the green. Um, we spent the day measuring trees. Uh, I must admit, I'm much more of an animal person than a tree person. I had a great day, learned a lot, and was able to take some of the things I learned in my classroom. So look for those opportunities um, around and about. And finally, as I said, this is not the You've learned everything about 5E and ADI. Um, so I have a couple of websites here. Uh, if you want to look further into them, uh, those are good places to start. So Lucy, I think that's, I think we're about 10 minutes away and. Yeah, that was perfect timing. Thanks so much. Um, that was great. So as I mentioned before, uh, there's the chat box on the bottom. We're gonna give you a few minutes for anyone here. If you have any questions for Allison, um, just type them into that chat box and, and we'll read them off and she can answer. So we'll give everyone a minute to kind of think and, and start typing any questions you have. Great.
questions, comments, ideas? Do you think this would work? I mean, we, we've got, got a couple minutes to anything, so it doesn't have to be direct questions. Any comments or feedback as well, always really helpful. Or things to share. If I know from uh, some of the comments, some of you are already using 5E in your classrooms. Um, if you have suggestions for other people, we also have people who had never heard of 5E. So we've got both spectrums here today. And, and I do not claim to be the all-knowing expert, so everybody, you know, feel free to, to add in. We have one comment here saying, uh, thanks so much, that was great. Wish my teachers had formed lessons like these when I was in school. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I kind of wish I was a student again. It would be a lot of fun. <laughs> it feels good. If you're a teacher going on expedition, you're teaching the science classes, I think that we all wish we had had when we were kids. <laughs> I will give people one more minute here if there's anything else you want to add before we wrap up. Feel free to post it. We have Oliver, who's a fellow from this summer, saying, can you talk a little bit about how you use the empirical, theoretical, or analytical criteria? I didn't, I didn't quite hear you. Yep, I'll repeat it. We have Oliver. He's one of our our teacher fellows this summer, and he said, can you talk a little bit about how you use the empirical, theoretical, or analytical criteria? And focusing on the quality of an argument is the context. Okay, so in the quality of the argument, we can look at quantity, and if you pull some of the 5E as well, in observations, of course, we all know we have qualitative and quantitative. And when looking at the argument, especially the students, look at quantitative data stronger because they can see that the numbers support it as opposed to qualitative, which is more of a, a description. So in middle school, and if you're teaching high school, I definitely think you can do more empirical analysis on the data and talk about what are the margin of errors? You know, how much can we base our, our uh, claim? or justification of the claim on the data. So that I think that that changes really how strong the argument is. One of the things I've seen in, in peer review is those teams that use quantitative data, the students get it more and they are able to say, okay, I can see how this shows that your claim is correct. Where if it's uh, qualitative, very descriptive, students will say things like, well, how do you know that? You know, how do you know that male bird is preferred because it's prettier? What does prettier mean? You know, how, how do you qualify that? So I look at both qualitative and quantitative, um, but I'll say quantitative data is what I concentrate in the classroom, which is really important for that. And then in high school, I would definitely do some more statistical evaluation of that data. And we also had a just a note from Kathy saying you did a great job of this. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Okay, if no one else has any questions, I think we'll wrap up now. Um, we will. This has been recorded, so we will be sharing it um, in case you missed the first few minutes or anything like that. And I know some others had reached out saying um, they wanted a recording but couldn't make it today. Um, additionally, if you want to follow up with Allison, feel free to email me and I can connect you if you have any questions that come up after uh, thinking about it later today or this week. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. And thanks to everybody for spending part of your afternoon or evening here. I know it's long days and it's summer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank
thank you everyone for joining in. Thanks so much, Allison. Have a great rest of your day or evening if you're East Coast. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs>